Hello to all and welcome to the Alabama Public Health Training Network. Thank you for joining us today for our program, Beyond Gender, The Basics of Transgender Care. If you have a question about anything being discussed today, please call or email during our broadcast. The phone number and email address are on your screen now and will appear again later in the program. Also, the handouts, the sign-in sheet, and evaluation are all available online. You will need to register for this program in order to access those materials. Continuing education credits have been approved for nurses and social workers for today's program. In order to receive credit for this training, you must watch the entire program, then complete and return the sign-in sheet and evaluation. While content may continue to be relevant, CE credit will only be awarded for one year for nurses expiring on November 30th, 2017 and two years for social workers expiring November 30th, 2018. I am Beth Allen, Nurse Practitioner Director for the Bureau of Family Health Services and the Alabama Department of Public Health. And under the guidance of Dr. Grace Thomas, our Assistant State Health Officer for Family Health Services and Women's Health Medical Director, we would like to welcome our presenter, Dr. Jennifer Hastings. Dr. Hastings is a family practice physician and assistant clinical professor at the University of California, San Francisco, Department of Family and Community Medicine. She is also the director of medical programming with Spectrum Gender Spectrum and Director of the Transgender Health Care Program at Planned Parenthood at Mar Marmonte Santa Cruz. Welcome, Dr. Hastings. Thank we you. are so honored to have you today. That's very kind. And we just welcome your expertise and look forward to it. Thank you again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here. And thank you so much, Dr. Taylor, for extending the invitation. This is an area that is changing rapidly, and so while I'm so glad that the CEU is good for one year and two years, mm -hmm. uh, the material really is evolving rapidly, and so I encourage people after this presentation not to sort of sit back and go, okay, now I know it all about transgender health care. It actually really moves quickly, so I encourage people to use some of the resources and get um, connected to ongoing sources of continuing education around the area of transgender health care. I have no, um, nothing to disclose in terms of a commercial relationship um, and everything that we're talking about in terms of medications are actually off, off label at this point, but there are guideline, guidelines and recommendations both nationally and internationally for, for what we're talking about. So it's not as if we're just flying off the seat of our pants or something. So we have very ambitious objectives today. We've packed a lot into these two hours. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, hang on because it goes pretty fast. And this is also an area where people may not have had, to their knowledge, personal experience about uh, transgender health care or meeting or knowing a transgender person or a gender expansive person. So we're kind of going into new territory, perhaps. And I just encourage you to open your hearts. This is um, something where heart and mind are both important for um, increasing knowledge and awareness and working, I hope, with transgender patients because they're in your communities. You may not be aware, but they're there. So we're going to uh, look at gender affirmative language. Language is changing, and language is very community-based. So the language I'm describing may be different in your communities. I want us to explore the difference between sex and gender, and sexuality and gender, and talk about how to create a safe space in your health centers for the LGBTQ community. I also want to look at the basics of gender-affirmative medical care including um, looking at the basics of providing hormones and looking at surgery and preventive care. I, I want to just say at this point that the slides that you all received uh, were slides that were modified slightly from what I sent. 
and um, I have further modified them today. So for those of you who love to go slide by slide with a presenter, there may be a little bit of jumping around and changing. So please don't get disconcerted by that and try to just, try to just listen. You're going to um, learn at least four online resources for gender affirmative care. And those resources are um, constantly evolving. So I've picked ones that are, are not fixed in stone, but that will evolve as practice recommendations change. We're going to look at strategies for pregnancy prevention for LGBTQ clients, and also looking at different pathways to parenting for the LGBTQ community. Historically, we haven't thought that the LGBTQ community wanted to create family, but in fact, just like the rest of us, you know, we want to we want to create family, and how do we do that? And then very briefly, we're going to look at issues for transgender youth, and really depending on our time, uh, whether we have, I, I have some extra slides if we have time to um, look at that in a little more detail. So LGBTQI, that's a long acronym and one that actually changes um, with time. And at this point, um, the sex and gender minorities, it's a, it's a term that the federal government has used. And this is a, actually a federally protected status at this point. And the Affordable Care Act expanded coverage for the LGBTQ community and included jo non gender non-discrimination protections. So let's look at that acronym. So L for lesbian, G for gay, B for bisexual, T for transgender, and Q uh, queer and questioning, I could be intersex, and A actually has a lot of different um, concepts, so ally, androgynous, asexual, agender. So you may see different um, presentations of this acronym, sometimes just LGBT, mm -hmm. sometimes LGBTQ, and we're going to explore a little more about what these different um, concepts mean. So um, sex, we typically just think of, you know, what's between the legs. A, someone, a child is born, what do we think? Or what do we, what do we ask? First question is typically, is it a boy or a girl? Mm -hmm. And so we think of sex uh, as really physical anatomy or chromosomes. And the, the respectful con uh, terminology right now is that you were assigned male or female based on physical anatomy because, in fact, our gender identity may be very different from what is between the legs, which is typically a penis or a vagina. And in fact, gender identity is an internal or deeply uh, felt sense of self in relationship to, to whether you feel male or female, or actually maybe neither male nor female, which may be a new concept for some people in the audience. Gender expression is how I share my my gender identity with you. So that could be with clothes or haircut. Uh, typically in our culture right now, pink we think of as a girl color and blue is for boys, but that's actually very uh, embedded in, in time. So in the 1920s, pink was the male color and blue was the female color. And people are like, what? That can't be. So these concepts of gender are actually, uh, can move through time and are very much time-based and are not set in stone, although some people think they are. Now, what about sexual orientation or sexuality? And um, I'm going to break down sexual orientation and sexuality into attraction, who I'm drawn to sexually or emotionally, my behavior, what I do actually between the sheets or not on the sheets, and then um, my sexual identity, so how, what I share to the world. And this is particularly important for us to explore a little more deeply as healthcare providers. Because if a person shares that they're, let's say, heterosexual, you have a male client coming into your office who says, you know, I mean, it may or may not have the opportunity to share what their sexual identity is, but somehow it comes up that they see themselves as heterosexual. We cannot make the assumption that that person doesn't actually have a sexual relationship with another man and actually be at risk for HIV acquisition. We cannot make assumptions. But we also have to create a safe space where people can actually tell us what's going on. Um, and I wanted to, so in, the, in your slide there, you have a couple of words that you may not be familiar with. Same gender loving is uh, in the African-American community. Um, 
and asexual will be someone who says, you know, actually I'm not uh, attracted to anyone and I'm not sexually active with any anyone. Um, someone who is pansexual uh, feels attracted and um, may have sex with men and women and uh, or um, agender people. So agender being that you don't actually feel that you have a gender. So how, how I identify does not actually have a direct relationship necessarily to who I have sex with. Um, I think this is um, something we don't necessarily re recognize. We certainly weren't taught that in school. Um, then sexual behavior is what actually happens. Um, and we'll have an opportunity down the road to, to explore this a little bit more. The important point, though, right now is that sexual orientation and gender identity are two different things. Sometimes uh, when someone shares that they're transgender or when someone thinks of someone as transgender, they go, oh, they're gay. So there's often a conflation or a confusion or saying that those two things are the same. And they're actually quite different. So um, sexual or orientation is what we just dis discussed and in a sort of simplistic way, who I go to bed with, whereas gender identity is who I go to bed as. And so that might help. It's a little bit cutesy and I'm a little... I don't really like cutesy things necessarily, but I think that can help um, help folks understand the difference between those those two things. So, when we look at these different concepts, gender identity, gender expression, sex assigned at birth, who I'm attracted to, who I'm romantically attracted to, we can sort of see these each of these concepts on a spectrum. So I may not land at one extreme or another. So there's male and there's female, but there's all that space in between in terms of gender identity. And it's a very rich space and not one that our society really recognizes because on your um, driver's license it says male or female, right? There's nothing in between. You can't say, well, I'm a little bit, uh, I may be uh, female assigned at birth, but I, I, I really identify as more masculine. There's no space in our society right now for those in-between spaces. But as healthcare providers, those in-between spaces can be quite important. I just want to add that in the state of Oregon and now in the state of um, California, there is a uh, non-binary designation on a driver's license. There have been several people who've successfully gotten a non-binary identity marker, so that's kind of interesting. But I just want to point out this concept of spectrum in all these different areas. Um, and if we had a whole day to together to explore these concepts, each of us would look, take these different concepts and sort of reflect uh, within ourselves about where we lie uh, or where we find ourselves, where we would plot ourselves on each of those those lines or those uh, concepts. And it's a rich place to explore and I I'll go into this a little bit more uh, in, down the line about how important it is for us to know ourselves uh, in order to, to do better care for our patients. And this is another kind of schema of looking at all those rich places in, in between the, the binary markers. So we have male and female, but there's this rich area inside of, of uh, masculine agender, feminine agender, uncertain, all of it. I, I identify with all of it. Um, and the concept of gender fluid is becoming more and more important, and we're seeing it more in youth, where uh, kids are saying, you know, I feel this way today, but tomorrow... I may be different. Now, for some parents, this can be extremely frustrating because they want their kids to, you know, just be in one place, please. But uh, I encourage people to, you know, to have an open mind about what, how powerful and freeing uh, some of these concepts can be. Um, I'll just take an example of, you know, in our female society, or excuse me, in our society right now, being a woman has much more space for uh, gender expression. So I haven't worn uh, a dress in probably 40 years, and that's, there's no problem with that. Um, but for a person assigned male at birth to wear a dress, that there's, there's a lot more pushback on that. And um, hopefully our society is moving towards a place where there's more freedom for people to express the way they feel inside. I'll also uh, be somewhat um, open with you today and share that I'm finding myself much more not identifying anymore um, a 
as purely female, and much I find myself much more drawn to a non-binary identity myself. And I think um, uh, I'm impressed with how difficult that can be to share with people. And so being vulnerable uh, can be hard, but I think it's it's a rich place. And I encourage each of us as healthcare providers to do that exploring. So let's look more at the, at the term transgender or trans asterisk, which you may see it's now coming into to popular use, the trans asterisk. Basically, um, uh, the concept is that there are many identities underneath that transgender or trans umbrella. So um, two-spirit, which comes from the um, Native American community, agender we already talked about, androgynous. Um, and so being transgender is not sort of one fixed thing. There's a lot of identities within that con with that terminology. Cisgender you may be seeing more in publications and that's basically when your I, your self-identity around gender is congruent with what you were assigned at birth. And I don't know if it shows up on your screens but the, the term cis and trans comes from our, you know, our chemistry days with a, what, what was the, the, the molecule on either side of the double bond. And if you were on the same side it was cis, a cis molecule and if it was on opposite it was trans. So cisgender is um, something you'll be seeing more uh, in the media, I think. And then the concept stealth is, um, I think, important to understand as well. So if your status, uh, your gender identity is not shared with others, then, then the term, and this is a term that is sometimes, it, it's a controversial term, I'll say, and uh, it can be, depends on your community, but some it's a respectful term uh, in some communities, but not in others. So you want to think about whether how you use this term. But basically, uh, the relevance for the healthcare system is is huge. So many transgender men, uh, you know, there's no way you would know that they were assigned female at birth. And if they come into a health setting, um, and they don't feel com you haven't created a safe space, they're not going to tell you. And if they've already had their uh, documents changed, there's no way you know that this person was assigned female at birth. Now, they have some health care needs that we'll discuss later. They might need a pap smear. But if you don't know that there's a cervix and a uterus that perhaps needs preventive screening, you're not going to, you know, offer that. So... This is I, another, I'm just trying to highlight why this is important work for you and why it's important to work on creating safe space for transgender people. So more on terminology. So I've used already the word a transgender man or a trans man or trans masculine. So this is someone who is assigned female at birth who might be on testosterone if they're transitioning hormonally. Um, and the acronym FTM or F to M uh, was in common use quite a bit um, and is, I think, falling, not, not used as frequently, but you may see that in either in literature or in um, research papers um, or in your community. It still may be a respectful term. Assigned female at birth, AFAB, is not used as much in terms of an, of an acronym, but is an important concept. So this is basically, um, so transmasculine, someone assigned female at birth, identity male. Trans woman or trans feminine is someone who is assigned male at birth and is transitioning uh, towards female or feminine. And again, assigned male at birth is another designation for this identity. Gender queer may or may not be something that's in your community. So this is, I think, so the term gender queer uh, used to be quite disrespectful. Um, but now has been claimed by the community and basically refers to a huge range of identities outside that binary that we were talking about earlier and can also refer to sexuality. So someone can identify as queer and that just means that they're not, they're not heterosexual or that they may be uh, pansexual depending on their identity. So I'll just say a little more about the, this out of the binary or gender spectrum or gender queer to say that there are many different terms for this um, and that, again, knowing what your, is local to your community. In, in, so lots of different terminology, demigirl, ladyboy, neutrosis, agender. And more and more common, this community is asking for an, a non-binary gender neutral pronoun. And the most common one is they. And there's my little thing saying language is always evolving. And that's a reminder that what it, I'm saying today may or may not be true 
you know, a few months or a few years from now. Um, but here is kind of a cutesy, uh, handy guide, like, well, how do I say this? Okay, so they went to the store to buy themselves a hat. Now, this is referring to one person. So they is actually a singular pronoun. And some people get very bent out of shape with this. I mean, especially maybe your English teacher, right? <laughs> so, turns out, Shakespeare and Chaucer used they as a singular pronoun. And there is movement in our current parlance to accept they as correct, it is correct grammatically. And there's a writer from the Baltimore Sun who has a grammar um, uh, section in the Baltimore Sun, and, and he has proclaimed that they is a it is correct usage grammatically to use they as a singular pronoun. And here are some other examples there on that chart. So Z here, Z or Zem, and um, ways that you can practice. So all of you can look at that at your leisure after this program. Um, historically, out of the binary or non-binary um, non has been in the, our Native American community for many, many centuries. And in India, the Hijra, um, this is a a uh, group of people who um, identify as female but were assigned male at birth. And if you look in many other cultures besides our own, non-binary is highly respected um, and often um, given a, a, f a thought is that there's kind of a, a greater spiritual power for someone who is uh, non-binary. Three to Infinity, Beyond Two Genders, is a film that you can um, easily access and explores this concept more. Um, lots of different people who are sharing their experience, and I recommend it to you if you have time. Well, this is a difficult time in our culture for transgender people, and um, in 2011, the, a report of the National Transgender Discrimination Survey was, was published. We're um, about any moment now to get the 2015 um, it'll be published in 2016, but the data was collected in 2015. But we finally got, you know, sort of research showing what we knew, which is that discrimination is pervasive in all aspects of life for transgender people in education, employment, housing, health care, public accommodations. It's a difficult road if you're transgender. Um, you're four times more likely to have a household income less than 10,000 and four times the national rate uh, for HIV and eight times the national rate if you're a person of color for HIV acquisition. So this is, um, you're basically seeing the reason why this is so important for you as healthcare providers. In addition, there was a much higher rate of depression and 41% attempted suicide compared to the general population of 1.6%. This is you know, terrible and something that we're really trying to do something about so that transgender people feel safer and feel that they don't have to commit suicide in order to, to you know, sort of exist. In healthcare, we got a lot of data about the challenges, um, people be, being deferred care. Um, I think the 50% being, you know, teaching their own provider, I think that's very low. None of us learned about this in medical school. So um, it's time that we, we learn. I wanted to bring up the concept of intersectionality, which um, is relevant in that um, if you're a person of color and you're transgender, and let's say you have difficulty um, walking or you have some kind of disability, each of these um, forces of discrimination and oppression sort of pile up on top of each other and make existence just more difficult. And um, Kimberle Crenshaw does have a TED talk that I encourage you to uh, watch called The Urgency of Intersectionality. Um, and I, I think it's well worth your time. Just I think it helps us be more connected to, to our patients. So these are a couple other, that graphic there looking at race, education, sexuality, ability, all these forces that kind of, um, as I said, pile up on top of each other and make life and access to health care more difficult for our patients. Um, the health care reform that we saw happening uh, over the last eight years, which, you know, we're at a point in time where um, this may change, but it definitely improved access to health care for our LGBTQ community. Um, and we'll just see where things go. Uh, from here. But let's talk about what you can do to create a, self, a safe health center. And I, you know, safe bathrooms is like, you know, why is that important? Well, if you 
don't feel safe going into the men's room or the women's room, and in fact, um, I just did a talk at our local community college, people unbelievably get assaulted in the bathroom if someone thinks they're in the wrong bathroom. It's really incredible that something so, so a basic necessity, right? Having to pee and poop, that's basic, right? Well, you go into a bathroom just to do what you need to do and to be assaulted in a bathroom is just, you know, unbelievable and terrible and very hard. So what, something we can do in our health centers is create a, a safe space. And there are different ways to do that, and we can perhaps, if there are questions about it, we can talk about it. But also knowing that most people have already experienced trauma before they go to your health center. And we as providers and we as the front desk people have to know that and have a sensitivity to that. So creating a self and welcoming space is incredibly important. You can do this by inviting um, your community groups to come into your health centers and say, what can we do to make it safer? Ha help them design what you do. Um, having posters up, uh, uh, magazines that uh, reflect their community. Um, okay, I already mentioned the gender neutral bathrooms. These are small things, but they're very powerful. They mean a lot. Our healthcare forms are very uh, binary and, and we don't necessarily get the information we need with our forms. So taking some time to look at our healthcare forms and see, you know, are people able to share openly and honestly what, what's going on for them? What pronoun do you use is a very powerful uh, gesture and meaningful. The trick is you have to, if you uh, ask it, which I hope you will, you need to have a way that the, all, everyone in your health center knows what that pronoun is. So if I say, well, my pronoun is they, and then the next person who sees me says, gee, uh, you know, we haven't done very well, have we? But it's hard. It really is hard. But it's, that doesn't mean we, we give up. I think... Um, Acknowledging if we make a mistake is powerful, and actually, I think I have a slide about that coming up. Um, having the spectrum that we talked about of gender and sexuality you know, in your form, that's challenging, but I think we can do it. And then a way to document um, who the patient is we're seeing, and having templates that you know, have both, for example, prostate and uterus and ovary all in the same form, so you're not you know, clicking from, if you're on electro, are you all on an electronic record now? Not quite. Okay, well, it actually is easier on paper um, because you can write mm -hmm. things in. Mm -hmm. Once you have something as an electronic template, you're sort of stuck with it. So in a way, this is good that you're still on paper because then as you move towards electronic, you can be more inclusive. Um, training the entire staff. I, the front office staff and our um, medical assistants are so important. Um, and if you're as you do this, I really encourage to include your front office and back office staff in your trainings because they are so, they're so important. If someone kind of glances sideways or like a, huh, you know, a trans guy, a trans man saying, I need a pap smear, and the front office goes, what? What are you, you're a guy, you don't need a pap smear. They'll probably walk out or they'll never come back. So we, we have to be inclusive ourselves in our trainings. Um, the National LGBT Health Education Center has fantastic resources. I'll mention a few more um, as we move on. And 10 Tips for Serving Transgender Patients is a publication from the um, Transgender Law Center. And it's just a nice brochure that's easy. And you can um, learn a lot from it, I think, if you implement their recommendations. So this is just a little, you know, comic. You had me at your ask of my preferred gender pronoun. Now, this is a good example of, cha of changing language because preferred gender pronoun is actually no longer considered the way to ask. I don't prefer it. It is my gender pronoun. So cross that out. I, I, I got to do that. Do a big black mark across preferred. Um, just to, and that's a great example of how what was uh, sort of correct parlance is, is no longer. And this is another kind of graphic to just share, you know, what it feels like when you have the wrong pronoun. You feel kind of suffocated and like someone's like stabbing you. It's a, another, another um, terminology for this. It's called a microaggression. Uh, microaggressions are little tiny things that don't feel right but really hurt. And you pile up all these microaggressions and you feel assaulted. Even though it's like some, it doesn't matter. It's just, I just, you know, it's just a little pronoun. What does it matter? Well, it hurts. It may, it may seem tiny on the outside, but on the inside, it actually uh, has a big impact. 
This is another resource, uh, the Center of Excellence for Transgender Health. I'm um, part of their medical advisory board, and they have a very, uh, like a 15-minute um, training for front office staff that, that you can take a look at and see if it might meet your needs. Um, sexual orientation and gender identity, that's uh, part of Meaningful Use 3, I believe by sometime in 2017. This needs to be part of the information you gather. What is, and the recommendation that the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, has, uh, has adopted and recommended is w asking what is your current gender identity and, that, and you leave uh, many options, always some place for someone to share their own identity. So, and without saying other, because if you click other, that's the, the concept of, oh, you're other, is another one of those microaggressions. So just leaving a blank space for someone to fill in what their identity is. And then what sex were you assigned at birth? Then you um, uh, get a sense of, you know, what anatomy might be there, and that's important as a health, health center. So, and if there's a discrepancy between, or difference between, let's say someone uh, says my current identity is male and I was assigned female at birth, then you know that there has to be some increased sensitivity on the part of your staff and you as a healthcare provider. Um, this, is, this is tricky stuff in terms of the electronic record. And um, I've been able to be part of a couple, um, so Epic is one of the larger um, electronic record systems and we've spent many, many hours trying to work out something that, that makes sense and is user friendly for the provider and respectful to the patient. So here we are, the, four, the poor spork doesn't know where to go, right? So that's why we have to have a bathroom that makes this spork feel comfortable. So this is something I made reference to a little bit earlier in the, in the presentation about how, um, you know, really, A, you know, looking at, your, at, your, at yourself, but also um, looking at the person in front of you less by the physical attributes and more by something, you know, deeper. Um, and so that requires some deepening on our part as providers. But being an ally to this group is just, just tremendous, something that actually um, feels really good. And we need that as providers, right? I want to also share the concept of cultural humility rather than cultural competency. Um, we have a lot of cultural competency trainings, right? And in, I think the concept of cultural humility allows us to really see who that person is in front of us. If we make assumptions about someone, like, I see you, I know, I know you, we're missing a lot of what that patient probably wants to tell us or share with us. And I think cultural humility allows us, allows the patient to feel safer. I want to talk a little bit about transition for, for trans folks, and there is not one way to transition. There's not a right way to transition. There's a huge amount of... Um, diversity within this diverse community. Um, uh, we have some examples in the, in the public. We talked about this last night. You know, we have Caitlyn Jenner, who basically went from a very stereotypically masculine person to, you know, an, extreme, an extremely feminine, feminine person. Um, cover of Vanity Fair. Most people who transition don't have that either that luxury in terms of resources to transition, um, but may not even want to be that hyper-feminine. So I think we just want to hold a bigger space for what, what transition looks like. Um, but basically the concept of transition is increasing the congruity between how I feel inside and how I, how I present externally to the world. And that's, I think, the underlying concept of what transition is. And it takes time. And over time, that identity inside may evolve. Um, so someone early in transition may not want to share with you their pronoun. Their pronoun inside may be she, but they're still presenting and look masculine, so they don't want to say to you, my, my pronoun is she. They're not ready to share with you what is deep inside. So... Let's look a little bit, bit about this. So I'm going to break transition to, into different parts or different pieces. Psychological transition is really that inner internal process of 
my own kind of coming to awareness of how I feel about myself in terms of gender, how I think, how I behave, what I share with other people is actually social transition. If I'm sharing what's going on inside, I'm letting you know that my gender is different from what you thought it was. Um, that can be changing the way I dress, getting a different haircut, letting my hair grow. Um, and just to point out that for, for children, social transition is all that's needed before puberty. Um, but for someone who's already gone through puberty, they can't undo, you know, the thickened vocal cord or Adam's apple. They can't undo the beard if they're transitioning to female. Um, legal transition is when I change my name and gender on uh, identity documents, I get my birth certificate changed. That requires uh, medical support and assistance. Um, you have to have a letter from a medical doctor to change um, your passport, for example. Not all states allow you to change your birth certificate, um, but many do. Um, Social Security uh, can be changed. And then medical and surgical transition is accessing medical care uh, to transition using hormones uh, or surgery. And the important thing about all this is that not everybody, not every transgender person wants to do all these parts of transition. So um, as we've already talked about, um, you know, someone will choose or, or, and actually it's not always a choice, right? If I don't have the resources to access hormones and surgery, I may want it, but I can't necessarily do it. Um, so this is um, kind of a useful slide, let's say, for a therapist working with a transgender person to look at like the different p aspects or, or things involved in transition and you might cut these out and order them like say, okay, this is what I think I want to do. I maybe want to um, do some counseling and then I want to um, do physical changes and then I want to try to access medical care, but someone else may decide to do it in a different order. Let's now look at the big picture uh, in terms of hormones. And actually, um, before we do this, are there have any questions come up on the email? No, okay. So uh, I want to encourage, it was already mentioned that um, by you, I guess, that we can, um, people can, can email in questions. Email I know this is a lot of material, so please do let me know if you have questions. Um, okay, so if I'm, um, assigned male at birth and my identity is female and, want, and I want to feminize, um, I need two things basically, uh, two or three. I need estrogen because that's the feminizing hormone and I can take that um, intramuscularly. I can use a patch. I can take a, use a cream. In the United States, we use a safer form of estrogen. Ethanol estradiol is actually more thrombogenic, causing, causes more blood clots than the 17-beta estradiol. What's interesting is that ethanol estradiol is what's in our birth control pills. And they use that, we use that in birth control pills because it has such a sustained uh, blood level. It do, we don't go up and down. But it was decided that for transgender women, we didn't want to take that additional risk of increased blood clots, so we used the 17-beta the estradiol. This is why we really encourage trans women not to use birth control pills to transition. That said, many trans women who don't have resources will either get their estrogen on the Internet without the support of a medical provider, or they'll get access to birth control pills, perhaps from friends or something. Um, so, as I said, we, we don't encourage the use of birth control pills, but it is done quite a bit. Uh, in addition, an antiandrogen is needed. So if you look at estrogen and testosterone, estrogen is not as powerful. Testosterone is much more powerful. So if I were to just take estrogen, I probably, if I was assigned male at birth, I would not transition either very fast or very much because I, my estrogen just can't or the estrogen I'm taking can't overcome the testosterone. So I need um, something to lower the testosterone, and in the U.S. we primarily use spironolactone, which many of you may know it's a medication to lower blood pressure. It's used in liver failure. Um, it's relatively safe. It does cause problems with potassium sometimes. So you have to monitor that. Um, but uh, that's our, the, what we use primarily. We also can use finasteride, which prevents the conversion from... Um, testosterone to a more potent form of, di of testosterone ca called dihydrotestosterone. So those are the two antiandrogens we use. And then sometimes progesterone. 
Progesterone um, is thought to increase the breast size, um, increase the fat in the, uh, in the nipple area to give a more mature appearing breast. Um, but some people feel that it ha increases the risk for heart disease uh, or heart, heart issues. And um, it, it can make you kind of cranky, moody. So um, we don't necessarily, um, well, we, we can, it's there as an option. That's the way I like to present it and sort of present the pros and cons. There's also some concerns about increased breast cancer with progesterone. So, so this is sort of our menu if you're a trans woman wanting to, to pursue medical transition with hormones. If you're a transgender man and you're, you're, your desire is to masculinize, then testosterone is all you need. You really don't need anything else. It's much simpler. Again, they're different forms. So it, intramuscular and subcutaneous is, more, is the more common uh, route, but we also have patches uh, and gels and creams and then a pellet that we don't use very much in the U.S. It's never prescribed orally because of the increased risk to the liver. What's fascinating is that in Europe they do. It's kind of interesting. Um, and we're, uh, for both trans men and trans women, we're looking to, uh, to get a physiologic level of, uh, meaning what the level of that hormone that you would have if you were born with an ovary or um, testicle. But is this really safe? Can we really do this? Are we going to cause more harm? Well, it looks like uh, there's very good evidence that we actually cause more harm by not prescribing, which is kind of not what people were, have been thinking for many years. Um, in terms of long-term health outcomes, we have good data from Europe. Holland has been doing this for a long time. We have like long-term studies looking at, at the effects on trans men and trans women. And for trans men, we don't see an increase in cardiovascular events. We really thought we would and we're not seeing hormone-related cancers, and we're not seeing osteoporosis. Um, and this is the study you know, that you can look at if you um, want to read more about it. Um, for trans women, they were on the more thrombogenic form of estrogen, the ethanol estradiol, so they did see um, increased blood clots uh, in women, and they saw increased cardiovascular death. Um, but not by a high amount. And actually, the more, more of the deaths were related to preventable, more preventable issues like uh, HIV and drug use. And so this also points up the importance, as it does with all of our patients, at looking at really lifestyle, uh, being overweight, not exercising, smoking, drug use. These are the things that really ended up um, causing premature early death. And we now have good data showing that hormone therapy improves health outcomes. So increased sense of well-being, decreased suicide and depression. Uh, really impressive that when people transition hormonally that their suicidality goes down uh, to, well, this says 30% but we saw 41% in a more, a more recent study um, to much closer to what the general population has. So. So this really is a powerful, powerful, powerful information about why it's important to support hormonal transition for people who want it. We see less victimization and, and homicide, decreased drug and alcohol use, um, decreased HIV risk behaviors, which is incredibly important, decreased homelessness, and increased access to preventive and primary care services. And I know that um, this is something the pu public health department is looking about uh, at of how to increase primary health care to, to your population, not just for transgender people, but for all people. So how do you do this care? Well, fortunately, we have both national and international guidelines. Um, this is, a, this is um, evolving because we're just getting new data, and so these are places you can go, and one of our objectives was to get these online resources, so here you are. So transhealth.ucsf.edu has, we just put out a, in June of 2016, we put out new guidelines. The National LGBT Health Education Center, which I referenced earlier for other resources, has great guidelines for providing medical care. In addition, WPATH, the World Professional Association of Transgender Health, has their version 7, which was published in 2011. Um, we, I'm really um, working on trying to get WPATH to, to 
be even more responsive. It's been five years since we had those guidelines. Things have changed. Um, but the other resources that I pointed out to you are stay um, are, though, are currently more current. Lion Martin Health Center has a project uh, consult line, so you can call them or email them and get get uh, support. And then Howard Brown in Chicago does great work. They have a beautiful um, protocol online that you can look at. It's just very very user friendly for providers. So let's look at this, hormonal therapy for trans women. I'm going to go a little bit more into depth about what transition might look like. And what's so important, it's like just as we were saying, people, diversity, you know, people, there's diversity in what people, in the order of what they do things. Not everybody um, has the same goals for their transition. And one of the things that's hard is that a patient may have a goal of very large breasts, for example, where a very breast focus society. People see having big breasts as you're somehow more female. You may not achieve that with, with hormones. So kind of bringing in reality to folks that, that they may have a desire to have very large breasts, but that may not be something that's accomplished. That can be tricky. Genetics is kind of interesting. So we used to say, you know, well, what are the, what's, what size breasts did your mom have? And then maybe that'll give a sense of what breast size you might have. Well, even within families, there's huge diversity of, of breast size uh, in my family as well. Um, so I'm not sure we can look to our mothers and, and say we know what size breasts we'll have. But genetics do play a role. We just, the, we, can't, we can't, you know, know what that would be. So here again is sort of highlighting the different forms um, for estrogen and spironolactone. Um, so what happens? So when you start uh, feminizing, your skin softens. You have less hair growth. Um, for example, facial, facial hair, body hair decreases. This is very exciting. Your, your muscle decreases, and um, the fat redistributes to a more classically uh, feminine um, form. Breast development is, is the... Uh, development that it, of all of these is permanent. Everything else I'm talking about is um, goes away if you stop estrogen, but breast development is pretty much a permanent. Um, sexuality can change. So as I start taking estrogen, my libido may go down. I may have less desire for for sexual intercourse if that's if I have a regular partner. Many trans women have already been married and have a, or have a partner, and involving the partner in this transition is very important. And um, not all relationships, you know, are sort of sustained throughout transition. So some people may lose their lifelong partner, which can be devastating. Um, uh, that said, some partners say, I love you, doesn't matter whether you're male or female or in between, I love you. And, and they're very supportive. And that's, of course, really wonderful when that happens. But in terms of sexuality, um, you can expect less ejaculate, um, less spontaneous erections. And uh, that said, it's not universal that everyone um, has decrease in libido, but it's, it's pretty pretty consistent. Testicular atrophy can occur. Um, in terms, well, I guess I have another slide about this, I think, uh, in terms of permanent or not. Now, the emotional changes that come with estrogen are fascinating. Um, and for me, watching and being present, I have the honor, I really, it is an honor for me to be present as people transition. People note that they have more access to their feelings and cry more easily. And this is, I mean, as when I first started doing this work, it was like, oh my gosh. You know, my, my own ex personal experiences with uh, people with testicles who, you know, c um, couldn't feel their feelings like, oh, is this hormonal? It's a little bit frightening, actually. Um, uh, the other thing is the multitasking. They can't, so with estrogen, actually, you start to be able to multitask. That said, there's good data that actually none of us can multitask very well. <laughs> we think we are multitasking, but we're actually doing everything less well. Um, but anyway, I just I think that the sort of emotional changes that occur with transition are, are fascinating and important to, to talk to people about that this may happen. Okay, so I didn't I took away the slides that I, that you probably have in your handouts looking at the what's permanent and what's reversible with um, with feminization. 
And I'm guessing that you're moving around on your papers because I moved some of the, the slides to make this flow, flow better. Um, okay, but what about the risks? So we talked about blood clots. Um, they're very rare if people are taking a non-oral form of estrogen. Um, liver and gallbladder issues are very rare. In fact, the new guidelines from the UCSF took away uh, monitoring liver function tests um, as part of your, your protocol. Getting high prolactin is also very rare, really only occurs if you have very, very, very high um, superphysiologic uh, levels of, of estrogen. Weight gain can occur, increase in blood uh, uh, pressure can occur, and we already talked about spironolactone ca can cause high potassium, and, but very rarely. So, feminizing hormones cannot lower your voice. So if you've already gone through puberty and you're a transgender woman and you have a nice deep low voice, taking estrogen and spironolactone is not going to raise your voice to a, to a feminine level. Um, it really can't change the shape of the bones, but the fat distribution does occur. And so many trans women will, will feel, and I think they're right, that they have a more feminine appearing face. And that's really from the the, where the fat is distributed on the face, cannot take away the, the Adam's apple that develops with puberty. And uh, estrogen can't take away the hair follicles. So if you've developed a beard, you take estrogen, yes, your hair grows less quickly, and you don't have to shave as often, but if you, you have to do electrolysis or laser hair removal of the face um, if you don't want to have to shave all the time. So um, that this really points up the importance for our, our youth of not going through the puberty related to their gonads because of these permanent changes that occur with, with puberty that really mark someone as, as the gender associated with, with their gonads. So um, I think a lot of older trans people have, a, are, have some anger and some frustration that they didn't have access to puberty blockers. In addition, uh, many older trans people share, they remember as children, their transgender identity and trying to share that with their parents or, and, and just getting t completely, you know, turned, shut off. Don't, you can't talk, no, no, you're, you've got a penis, you're, you're not a girl, boom, turn it off. So um, there's a, a lot of processing of, of emotions about that. And still as adults, it's often very difficult for families to accept um, that their children are, are transgender, and we have uh, some slides about that later. So now we're going to transition to talking about transgender men in a little more detail. And we already talked about how you, the more common is intramuscular and subcutaneous, and those are the testosterone cypinate there, the bottles of testosterone that are typically injected. What you see there um, on the other slide is the binder. So as a trans man, if you have already gone through puberty and you have your breasts, many uh, trans men will bind the breast tissue to, to compress it so that it's not, not visible. Um, so the, we talked through what happens with transgender women. For trans men, um, development of facial hair and body hair, acne, the voice deepening, the clitoris getting larger. Um, not having a period is often uh, the most important thing. And then the emotional changes. So just as we just talked about emotional changes for transgender women, trans men note emotional changes of being um, uh, more interested in sex all the time. Now that's an incredible, when I first saw this, this blew me away. It's like, this is no fair. This is no fair for the folks not on testosterone who maybe want to feel more sexuality. Um, and increased muscle mass, you know, people getting stronger. You need to watch out if you're transitioning. The, the muscle gets bigger before the ligament, or the tendon, rather. Uh, and so you have to be careful with not lifting too much weight as an initial transition. And fat redistributes to a more traditional male, um, traditional male distribution. And... Um, I think I didn't emphasize what I had on the, the slide earlier for transgender women. It really takes time. For trans women more than trans men, this takes time. You don't like pop, take your first pill or put on your first patch and you're instantly you're, you feminize. Um, for trans men, it is typically a faster path and a, and a more, um, because you're not overcoming something, you're really adding permanent changes, 
for, for transgender men, it's, it's really easier to be in the world because you really, uh, um, if I were to take testosterone in a, in a year and a half, you'd see me, and, you, and like I said before, you'd never know that I was assigned female at birth. And this, this is one of the big injustices for, for the trans community is that for trans women, it's just more difficult. So um, in terms of our consent, um, what's irreversible for a trans young man or a trans man is the thickening of the vocal cords. I get a deeper voice. I get facial and body hair. I get the Adam's apple. And I get, I'm now at risk for male pattern balding, which is a lot of trans men do not want. So, you know, some things you may not want, but they, they can come. Somewhat irreversible or somewhat, sorry, somewhat reversible is the clitoral enlargement that we talked about already. Um, and that enlarged clitoris is the basis for uh, phalloplasty or phalloplasty or the creation of the male penis surgically, which we'll talk about in a moment. What is reversible is the stopping of your period that happens with testosterone. If you stop T, your period will come back. The increased libido is also reversible. So I take testosterone and I I'm highly sexual, perhaps. Um, if I stop it, I won't feel that anymore. And then the fat and muscle distribution will redistribute if you stop testosterone. Important to look at the <coughs> risks um, that come with testosterone. Um, that's part of informed consent. Um, the red cells increase. Testosterone stimulates the bone marrow, so you get a higher, um, higher uh, hematocrit and hemoglobin. Um, LDL is can go up, but not, not a huge risk. Liver dysfunction is really <laughs> very, very rare and not something actually that's monitored anymore in the, in the protocols. Um, uh, testosterone is a teratogen, so if someone gets pregnant while they're on testosterone, they have, there's the risk that they have masculinized the fetus, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So here's an image of a trans man who, um, you know, there's no way you would know that he was assigned female at birth. Um, So here's a, a little bit of discussion in terms of um, testosterone and pregnancy. So even <coughs> though someone does not have a period, they may ovulate still. So that puts them at risk if they're sexually active with a penis and sperm. So you want to talk about birth control. Testosterone may or may not affect fertility. We used to say that it really did, that it rendered you sterile, but it does not, so if future fertility is desired, and we have a whole discussion in, in our next section about that. Um, banking eggs is um, expensive, so most uh, trans men do not have access to, to, to preserving their eggs. And testosterone is excreted into breast milk, so if someone is wanting to breastfeed, they should not be on testosterone. The binding that we talked about can cause skin irritation, so you want to check in with your patient if they're, if they're binding and make sure that they take time off from the binder. Some men are so dysphoric with their chest that they will keep sleep with them and then like never take them off. So that's just a check in to make sure they're having some, <laughs> some binder free time so that their skin can, can breathe. And pap smears, as we've already discussed, are important. If you still have a cervix and a uterus, then you need to check in on it. So I've spent a lot of time earlier talking about non-binary transition, and, and I won't go into detail now about that, but this is a great resource, Nutra.me. Uh, Micah has produced a beautiful set of, um, of talks that are recorded and resources on this, on this website. In terms of well-person care, probably the most important thing is you as a provider really willing to learn and to care about this person. And really, that's true for everything we do, isn't it? Because medicine doesn't stay the same. And so we need to, to always be willing and open to learning. Awareness of trauma and trauma-informed care. I don't know if trauma-informed care has made it to, to Alabama, <laughs> but it's a wonderful <coughs> approach to care, and I encourage you to, to explore that. Um, there are more resources on trauma-informed care. Um, and... Yeah, maybe you can do a webinar on, on that sometime. I think, I think you get a lot from it. And then really um, looking at sexuality, fertility, pregnancy, and parenting planning is what we'll do in, in the next hour. Preventive screening, um, really, if you have an organ, you need to screen it according to the guidelines that you as the organization, uh, as you're in your healthcare organization, <laughs> follow. So that said, 
it can be hard getting a pap smear covered for a guy. And um, that's one of the challenges we're, we're working on. But it doesn't mean you don't do it. We, may, we need to do it. In terms of breast care, if you've had chest surgery, um, then you do not, if you've removed the chest tissue, then there's no need for a mammogram. If you're a trans woman, then you would start doing mammograms um, after at least five to 10 years. So if you transition at age 45, it would be, you probably could start screening at, at 50. That said, I, I think we're, hopefully we'll get more data on when, when it makes sense to start because you've only been exposed to estrogen for five years. It probably doesn't make sense to start a mammogram right away. Um, that would be like screening a, you know, 18 year old or something. So more to learn on that, I think. Um, in terms of um, pap smear, the intervals same the same. There's no need to do increasing pap smears or increased interval or, or de rather decreased intervals um, for your pap smears. I don't know. Are you doing anal paps? No. Okay. So if you are doing anal paps, you would do the same, follow the same guidelines. There's no data to support increased cancer risk with testosterone, so you don't need to do increased screening. And then the prostate, the guidelines really stay the same. And as you probably, I mean, at this point, uh, prostate screening, PSA screening and prostate exams, I've really, we've really decreased in terms of our recommendations. So you wouldn't increase your recommendations for a trans woman. The, the prostate gets quite small. If you have a transgender patient and you're referring, you really want to sort of help this person get through the medical system because it can be hard. Uh, so you want to make sure they're, they're treated with respect along the way and really talk with the patient if they encounter discrimination and that they, that they should let you know so that you can figure out how to support them. So we're at the top of the hour. I think this is a great time to stop and take okay. a stretch break. Okay. Okay? Sounds great. great. Ten, oh, we have a question. Oh, okay. Can we quick, do you want to do it before we take the break? Okay. Sure. Let's do that. Um, the question is based on legal correctness in how we chart and how we use our CHR. A patient comes in and identifies as female that has male genitalia or parts. One clinic document, do, the documentation that was received listed the patient as female and then another documentation listed the patient as male. For the purpose of our charting, we used, what do we put in the, in the computer system that we use? Um, as I said, she was a female but has male parts. We had to use male, the male sheet for documenting um, and we had to use the male sheet throughout the chart, but we need to put her in as female in the computer system. Is this an audit exception and what is correct? So I don't know if Dr. Taylor gets to, I think, I mean, I think in terms of what's correct is um, she is female. Right but she has male anatomy, and this is what we just talked about earlier in the electronic record um, discussion, which is, so is she, is she legally female? It doesn't say. It doesn't say. Legally okay, legally so some, some clinics will um, use the gender in their insurance. Now, if she was not insured, then you're not bound by the insurance, and the most respectful thing is to use her female gender marker because that is her identity. And then you are going to have to start creating things in your electronic record to note that this is a female with a penis and testicles. And that's just, that's the movement. And so I love the question. So that means that you are seeing transgender people. And so um, this, is, this is great. And coming to consensus um, and increasing awareness for all providers. Um, yeah, it gets more complicated, and I'm not sure if that's a great answer. And maybe at the break, I'll talk with Dr. Taylor, and then we can um, add anything if, if you'd like. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions yet? No. Ma okay. Well, thank you for that question, and I hope there'll be more in the next yeah. hour. And then I'll have to speed up a little bit so we make it through our 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 uh, presentation. All right. See you in eight minutes. <laughs>
So welcome back. And Dr. Hastings, during the break we had one question, and it was just the transitional time for women when they are transitioning and on hormones. How long might that take? Right. So trans women starting estrogen and spironolactone can notice subtle changes within the first month or so, but the transition time is more like two to three years. And for both trans men and trans women, ongoing changes are noted past that time frame. So um, breasts can continue to develop um, even after two to three years. Mm -hmm. But, um, and, and we trans men experience that as well, that, that they'll get increasing facial hair even five to 10 years like a fuller beard five to ten years after starting transition so okay. it's it's a long okay. a long mm -hmm. haul yeah mm -hmm. thank you sure thanks so we're now going to discuss some of the more common surgeries that transgender people um, have increasing access to so with uh, the gen gender non-discrimination clauses um, in the Affordable Care Act these surgeries um, were covered actually in, in insurance companies and more and more insurance companies are private insurance companies are including transition-related care in, in their policies. And the um, Human Rights Campaign, HRC, has been doing a lot of advocacy work getting, um, and, and legal entity, legal groups, the Transgender Law Center, Lambda Legal, National Center for Legal Rights, are doing a lot of work um, increasing access to, to surgeries. So let's just walk through what some of the surgeries are. So for a trans woman, she may or may not want any of these surgeries that you're seeing. So orchiectomy is the removal of the testicles. Vaginoplasty is the creation of a vagina. Um, usually the, mo the most common approach is using the penile tissue and inverting that, and that makes the vagina. You can also use colon tissue. Um, you can also use um, the testicular tissue to extend the length of the vagina. Labiaplasty is the creation of labia. So there are some women, um, I have actually a patient who has um, cerebral palsy, and she knew that she would not be able to dilate, which is what you need to do after you have a vaginoplasty. So she didn't want a vagina, she just wanted the labia. So there was the appearance of a vagina. Um, breast augmentation is very common. As we mentioned, many women don't achieve the kind of breast size they want with just hormones. So breast augmentation is often desired. That is one of the surgeries that is less commonly covered by insurance. So that's usually a self-pay because that's considered uh, cosmetic. Mm -hmm. um, facial feminization, in addition, is often not covered, although there are advocacy groups trying to get both breast augmentation and facial feminization covered, arguing that this is actually not cosmetic. This is a part of, you know, in order for them to be in the world safely. And tracheal shave is the removal of the Adam's apple. I chose not to um, do show images of, for example, vaginoplasty, uh, and, but those are, um, you can go online and see, and I just want to say that vaginoplasty is a, is a beautiful surgery. Many, for many women, um, they go to an OBGYN's office and there's, the OBGYN has no idea that they were not born with a vagina. That's not the case for everyone, but it, it, overall it, it is a very successful surgery. Um, trans male spectrum, the most common is removal of the breast tissue and that's called chest reconstruction. So it's not just, you know, a mastectomy and that's it. You basically um, place the nipple in, a, in an area that makes sense um, in terms of the structure of the chest. Hysterectomy and oophorectomy, removal of the uterus and removal of the ovaries, as we discussed before, not required for health reasons, but many transgender men are dysphoric, meaning they don't feel comfortable um, having a uterus and, an, and ovaries, and so they remove them. Uh, that said, there's an increasing trend towards keeping the uterus and the ovaries because, as we'll see in a few moments, more trans men are interested in bearing children themselves. So they can have, in fact, a metoidioplasty, which is the creation of a penis and te testicles using local tissue, and keep their vagina and keep their uterus. Um, phalloplasty is the creation of the penis using tissue from other areas. So. Um, the most common uh, uh, area that you get penile tissue for is from the forearm or sometimes the uh, below the axillary region. 
Um, these are surgeries that historically were not very good, but they've improved dramatically. I want to say that for both the creation of the vaginal, vagina, the vaginoplasty, and the phalloplasty and motoideoplasty, there are still um, complications, a high risk of complications, so it's important that the patient is aware of that. Silicone is um, used by many trans people to achieve um, breasts or um, increased thighs and hips, and pumping parties are something we're seeing more of using industrial grade silicone, which really puts um, people at risk. So that industrial, ri uh, industrial risk silicone can migrate and causes uh, embolization, and then you can have a um, pulmonary embolus, which can be fatal. In addition, we're seeing the systemic inflammatory syndrome with silicone that also can be fatal. So we really uh, want to be sure to have a conversation with folks about the risks of, of silicone. And it's another reason why access to surgery is so important, because um, people feel desperate if they think they're not going to be able to, to have their body change in the way that they, they feel is important. Sexuality is, is fascinating, and I think I already mentioned some about sexuality and gender. We're seeing, I mean, so let's not make an assumption about what the sexuality is of the person in front of us, and that's true for trans people as well. Um, in terms of uh, the relationship between hormonal transition and sexuality, some people find that who they're attracted to and want to um, be involved with changes and evolves with transition. There was a study by Colt Meyer in 2013 showing that 40% of trans men that he interviewed uh, re reported a shift in their sexual orientation. So how do we talk to people about sexuality? I think this, this goes you know, beyond transgender care and, because it's really important for us to talk about this with all of our patients. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that we weren't taught very well in school is how do we find comfortable and inclusive language? How can we talk in a way that we're comfortable to people so that they feel like they want to share with us? So um, I want to suggest a great resource just came out, Safer Sex for Trans Bodies. It's an amazing document. You can just Google it, and it's about I think, 18 pages or so. I think it's useful for trans people and for trans and providers. Um, explores language and sexual practices and just talking also about how to have safer sex, which is incredibly important given the high risk of HIV in our communities. So what does it look like to talk about safer sex and how do we do this? Sharing fluids, do we use, what words do we use? And I think the important thing is you find language that works for you and, and have an open mind and an open heart. And I just clicked my microphone again, sorry. <laughs> um, so I'm going to offer some things, to, to, but really the important piece is that you do your own work in exploring what, what works for you. Um, you know, condom use is, has really decreased the rate of HIV acquisition, but you have to put them on and have to use them. And so having conversations with people of perhaps how, how can they integrate in this into their, into their sex life in a way that, that feels comfortable to them. Um, dental dams are something that I don't know if you offer them here, but um, can be useful. So you can use just um, a saran wrap or you know plastic wrap to to cover the labial area. Um, and there's some nice public health uh, brochures that you might explore that so that you can have those in your offices, um, kind of breaking the ice in a way. If you have those, you know, in the room where you are, then it might inspire people to ask more questions, or you could hand it to someone and say, you know, how, what ways do you enjoy having sex that increase your safety in terms of STD risk and HIV risk? So um, one of the things that we found in the in the San Francisco area was groups were incredibly powerful. Facebook groups, uh, having a private Facebook group for um, trans youth, um, teenagers who, you know, may not want to meet in person, but they'll meet in a, in a Facebook arena. That can be really powerful and something that the public health department could initiate. Um, and um, I also want to talk about, I don't know if you're doing PrEP and PEP, um, in your health department, but that, so post-exposure prophylaxis and pre-exposure prophylaxis have been incredibly well uh, received by the trans community, but a lot of folks don't know that it, it exists, so part of perhaps what you could do is 
specific to the LGBTQ community. Um, trans youth have the highest rate of HIV acquisition, um, and so reaching out to our youth, I think, is um, really important. So here's some thoughts on, on language. So what are the gender identities of your sexual partners? That may not flow off your tongue, so use other language, you know. But being, being direct in a way that, that um, allows people to actually be forthcoming. Um, maybe knowing about your sexuality can help me take better care of you. Does that work for you better? So do you have sex with someone with ovaries or testes? That Because that person, if you say do you have sex with men or women, that doesn't actually tell you what what's going on in terms of the risk for pregnancy, either causing pregnancy or getting pregnant, nor does it tell you really kind of what's, what's happening. What parts of the body do you use? Mm -hmm. So in our clinic, we had a fascinating time because um, we have urine, um, HIV, sorry, urine gonorrhea chlamydia, mm -hmm. and if you have a transgender woman, she pees in the cup, she has her penis still, she pees in the cup, that's not where she has sex, she has sex in her rear end. You can't, t doing a urine gonorrhea chlamydia will not give, give you the information you need. So again, having conversations about what parts of the body d might we need to test, if, if what parts are you using. Going to family creation, historically trans and lesbian and gay individuals were not thought to, to, to want to have family. Um, but, and so I love this quote, this is a, a new um, article that was published um, a few months ago, it was assumed that trans women would not want to be a father and trans, sorry, would forego the ability to father, so meaning, you know, using their sperm, and that trans men would forego the ability to mother or have a child, and that true transsexuals wouldn't want to. But in fact, we're seeing increasing interest uh, in the trans and LGBT community to, to have family. And so, uh, I have a number of articles here that I'm going to kind of move more quickly, basically saying that people actually already have family, perhaps before they transition, or um, that um, they want to be uh, parents. Um, this is an article from 2012, survey, survey of trans men and trans women, and again, uh, over 50% um, wanted to be parents and considered either freezing their eggs or sperm or wished that they had been offered. Um, that said, um, for trans women, many f say that it would be too dysphoric for them to, to donate sperm. So, and it's, it's extremely difficult, we know, to, um, to save and freeze eggs in terms of resources and finances. This is a really interesting, uh, more contemporary work from Anu Manchikanti Gomez, who's in the Berkeley area. She interviewed trans men and found that most of them had no idea that they could get pregnant or that, um, that they were at risk for pregnancy. They just assumed that testosterone meant that they couldn't get pregnant. Um, and so really clearly we need to, to do a better job at, at informing people of, of their risk of pregnancy and that they're able to get pregnant. This is a flyer from the public health department in Chicago. There's a young trans man who is pregnant. And being on testosterone, as we mentioned already, is a teratogen. So hopefully he's, he stopped his, his T. Um, so this is um, a question that um, came from, the, from California. The California Association of Family Practice um, suggested this. Are you or any of your sensual or sexual partners planning to get pregnant in the next 12 months? Does that roll off your tongue okay? And then you can figure out uh, you know, so if your patient feels safe uh, to share an answer, then that might help you, the two of you decide, is it, you know, do we need to think about birth control or how do we support you getting pregnant? So if the answer is no, then you really want to specifically address the LGBTQ identity. What, there's good research showing that um, trans or LGBTQ youth use contraception less frequently and are at higher risk of unintended pregnancy than their uh, non-LGBTQ youth counterparts. So um, kind of fascinating. So lesbian teenagers are actually at higher risk than their non-lesbian um, counterparts because the, the, they haven't had any sort of 
they, they basically turned off when there's anything about pregnancy prevention and using condoms or thinking about it because they're like, oh, that's not me. I'm a lesbian. I don't have to think about it. But then actually um, many times lesbian um, girls are involved sexually with men. So it's just fascinating that, that we make, again, it just goes back to what we talked about right at the beginning of the program, that the identity doesn't co correlate with behavior. So, uh, you know, 12-year-old lesbian girl is at higher risk for pregnancy than, than a non-lesbian girl. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and this we've already talked about. Basically, if you're a transgender youth, testosterone is not contraception and you need to be talk about it. If you're a transgender female, sperm can still be present with estrogen so you can cause a pregnancy. Um, so just asking. Um, if you're a trans man, probably the most appropriate contraception for you to use is a non-estrogen based contraception. So IUD is great. The Mirena is great because it, or I, I should not use a name, right? I should, and I'm not paid by Mirena, but a um, progesterone based um, um, IUD is great. The, um, an implant uh, has, is progesterone based, so again, won't interfere with transition, or a, 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 a Depo-Provera. And those are well, essentially, when you talk about this with trans men, these, these um, go over well. There's a new uh, kind of speak out um, that's coming from the University of California, and they approached me about being gender inclusive, so not having sort of all female appearing people in their brochures, but having, uh, uh, including the trans population in their, pop in their um, reach out to increase contraception where appropriate. So if someone does want to get pregnant, then you have to figure out, well, are they sexually active with ovaries or testes, and how is this all going to work? Um, and so I'm going to try to walk, walk us through how to support the LGBTQ community and different individuals in achieving pregnancy. And um, so we have prevention of pregnancy and then achieving a pregnancy, and they're both important. Um, Basically, you know, we need a sperm and an egg and a uterus, um, and it's amazing what is possible now with assisted reproductive technologies. Things have really moved quickly, and uh, that said, most of the people I see don't have access to assisted reproductive technology. It is typically not covered by insurance and is very expensive, and so really this is the purview of, of those with money. But I think it's interesting to talk about. Um, and just be aware. So, you know, we have donor sperm, we have donor eggs, you can freeze um, eggs and sperm. This, and so the freezing of eggs is relatively new, um, but in, and in Europe is quite advanced, and um, they feel very confident about the durability of, this, of the frozen gametes. In vitro fertilization is being used much more, and that can um, you can also do intravaginal or intracervical uh, insemination. And um, there's also surrogacy, so having someone else um, take the eggs and and have the pregnancy. But again, the all of these issues are are fraught with challenges. So. Um, I know that there was a suit a number of years ago, a trans man wanting to get pregnant, and basically the, the, the place he went said, sorry, we will not serve you because you're transgender. Um, that resulted in a suit, and so now uh, hopefully we'll be seeing changes uh, in the organizations that assist with um, reproductive technology. So it's, it's kind of space agey for those of us who um, aren't intimately involved with this, but it's... Um, very impressive. There was a um, woman who, so this is not in the trans population, but a woman who was doing cancer treatment, um, and she was actually pre-pubertal, so she had not yet gone through puberty, and her, uh, they took a biopsy of her uh, ovaries and put, planted them back after she had lived through her cancer treatment, and she was able to get pregnant. So her eggs matured after they were put back into um, her body, and she had a successful pregnancy. 
Um, so things, things have, are really moving along. So the main thing I want to say, though, with all this is that um, there are many ways to make family. It doesn't have to be your own biological tissue. So adopting um, foster kids, blended families, many, many ways. And I want to make sure that we don't sort of think that the only way to create a family is with our own biological uh, gametes. So let's walk through this. So if you're a lesbian woman, meaning so you're, you, ha you have a uterus and ovaries and you want to have a, a, a child with your partner who has uterus and ovaries, there are lots of combinations there of what to do. And probably some of you have friends or family who are already, or patients who are already engaged in this. So you find sperm from a friend or a relative or a donate or you purchase one. Um, you, some uh, lesbian couples, one has contributed the eggs and the other has contributed the uterus, so that's an option. And then, as I already mentioned, all the other sort of non-biological ways of, of creating family. Um, if you are to, to um, so if you're a gay couple and one partner has sperm, then you need to find some eggs and a uterus. Um, but it is possible, and there's more and more out there about um, ways to create family in a non sort of traditional heterosexual way. So for trans people, the similar options exist where, you know, if you have the resources to bank your eggs and sperm, but that's that's hard. Um, and actually stopping your hormones, so stopping your testosterone and stopping your estrogen are, is another option. We don't have a lot of data about it, but we're seeing successes, so people who, who have stopped their hormones. Um, so this came, so let's see. Um, so as I said, stopping testosterone is an option. You can uh, preserve your o oocytes um, uh, before you start. You can preserve one ovary uh, at the time that you have a hysterectomy, or you can keep your ovaries mm -hmm. um, when you have your surgery. Ah, there it is. Mm -hmm. I can read it better there. Okay, for a trans woman, you're going to... Um, possibly stop estrogen or do the sperm cryopreservation. I'm going to try to move us along here, so I want to get time for questions. In general, there's not a lot of information about creating family, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to bring it to you all. Um, it's expensive. It's invasive. We don't really know if it will work. People putting a lot of money into this and not really and having a, a big unknown. That said, I think that's true for for whether you're trans or not, not everyone is, is able to, to cause pregnancy or, or get pregnant. This is a paper I wanted to bring to your attention. It's looking at um, 41 transgender men who got pregnant um, when they were already identified as transgender. And I think this was the first time it really came to the attention of the medical community that transgender men actually wanted to get pregnant and were getting pregnant. So if so, we haven't really talked about blockers yet in depth. Basically, puberty blockers um, are medications that have been used for years in uh, children with puberty that comes too early. It's called precocious puberty, and so basically, we have forty plus years of experience with with using this medication. And it's inc it came came to my attention around two thousand eight. It's incredibly useful because basically you stop the progression of the puberty associated with the gametes, and then you can start a cross-hormone and then move into the world essentially without the secondary sex characteristics that are associated with your gametes. So in terms of fertility options for those youth who have not gone through their own puberty, at this point in time, there's not a lot of fertility options. But the example that I gave you um, a few moments ago about the woman who took the the section of or like a biopsy of her ovary and put it back in, that is definitely an option for transgender youth. Um, and, you know, children and adults may have very different priorities. So the parents may be all bent out of shape, like, oh, my gosh, if you use puberty blockers and then go on cross hormones, I won't have grandchildren. I mean, that's very real for parents. But for the youth, they're more focused on their own transition. They're not really thinking about kids. It's not developmental at, tw at the age of 12 to be thinking about um, having, having kids. So it's an interesting um, situation. I'm going to move us through here. So youth... Um, 
is a very rich area and really could use its own two hours or plus of discussion. But there's been an explosion um, both in the media and in medical care around the world in terms of supporting youth uh, to be authentic, to be themselves, and increasing awareness for parents about that this is really okay. It's okay to support your kid, which is not intuitive for some parents. Um, I like this um, comic. I think it says it all. Is it a boy or a girl? I don't know. They can't talk yet. So really, that points up what we talked about earlier in the session of really gender identity is something deep within. And you don't know my gender identity unless I tell you. So um, what we do know about gender affirmative care is that supporting youth is actually important. And if and so a lot of parents will say, well, how do I know? You know, they're only three or they're only five or only six. Well, they are being authentically who they are. They're not, they don't make it up just for kicks. This is, if, and if by supporting their gender identity, their distress goes down, I think you can feel fairly confident that you're on the right path. So l following your child and listening to your child, I think um, for those of us who have parented, that's, that's a pretty core concept, and it may go against what you feel around you and your communities. You may not get support from your church, from your schools, and that's one of the things that um, kind of needs to be happening, um, I think. But so for parents, this is a very difficult road. There are, I want to point out these two books, The Transgender Child and then The Transgender Teen that just came out uh, a month or so ago. What we do know is that with the the whatever acceptance is presented on the part of parents, that goes a long way to decrease suicide, depression, using drugs, um, and unprotected sex. So Caitlin Ryan um, from uh, San Francisco did this study, family rejection is a predictor of negative health outcomes. Very um, important work to, to sort of support what we know intuitively is that kids do better when their parents accept them and love them. Now, what does a transgender youth need? So if you're from two to eight or before puberty, really what you need is acceptance, love from your family, love from your, in, your community. If you're um, now in early puberty, kind of eight to 12, provider acceptance, the same things that you needed when you were little, but now you wanna consider puberty blockers. And then as you get older, those same things, always acceptance and support, but uh, those puberty blockers, and then you want to consider um, uh, cross hormones. So I'm going to move through a few slides here just because I want to, and I can move back to them if we have time and there aren't questions. But this is a great resource. It's called the Gender Quest Workbook. Very helpful for young people who are exploring their gender identity and want to figure out do they want to go the path of hormones or surgery down the way. We're seeing um, more and more youth, um, not, not universally, but we're seeing a section of youth who are really comfortable expressing their gender identity without uh, feeling that they want hormonal support. So it's kind of a new, a, a, different, a different way of expressing, expressing gender. We'll see, you know, we'll see where it goes. So I'm going to review some concepts here. Gender really is not a choice. It's who you are inside. Gender is a spectrum. Acceptance is key to health. And there are medical interventions that support gender identity. And again, not that everybody chooses to do or use or, or can to have access to those medical interventions. And pregnancy and parenting planning are possible for LGBTQ individuals. So this, that's really the essence of what I wanted to share with you today. I know it was a lot in a small amount of time, so thank you for your patience. So now we can, if questions have come up, if not, uh, if there are no questions, then I do have other slides we can go through to, to take the time. But I'm wondering if yes, anything has come up. Good. Um, it says, would you expand a little bit more about hormone blockers and at what age they are begun with children and how often the blockers are used and whether insurance covers these? Yeah, so I have some slides on the blockers way far down the way. 
So puberty blockers, as I said earlier, are gonadotropin-releasing hormones. And so, so basically, I'm going to show you how puberty works. And it was, this was a great, I, I did learn this in med school. I did not remember it <laughs> <laughs> until I started doing this. So basically, when the hypothalamus starts um, releasing gonadotropin-releasing hormone, it's in a pulsatile fashion. It goes off, on, off, on, off, on. And that is a signal to the pituitary to release luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. And oh my gosh, then <laughs> the testicles and the ovaries start making cross hormones. Now, the question was at what age? Is that correct? Okay, so it's really a stage, not an age, because puberty can be anywhere from 8 to 16. Mm -hmm. So you would not start a puberty blocking hormone until you begin to see just the beginning of puberty, and that's Tanner 2. Now, I'm going to go over now what will happen. So Tanner 2 is the beginning of breast buds mm -hmm. in a body with ovaries, maybe a little bit of pubic mm -hmm. hair, and in a body with testicles, you'll see the, the testicles enlarging mm -hmm. uh, slightly and a little bit of hair mm -hmm. in the pubic area. So when Tanner 2 then is starting, that's when you would ideally start a puberty blocker. Now, how many families regularly check in and say, are you getting a little bit of hair down there? That, that doesn't happen very often. So the whole process of when you have a transgender youth, having the conversation about communication around body changes, that's something I am really um, have sort of developed in my practice. And I have some laminated uh, sheets with showing what puberty is like. And it's really important to um, share with families that puberty doesn't happen like overnight. So if you start seeing the beginning of puberty, it's not as if, it, you know, the horse is out of the carriage house mm -hmm, or whatever the expression mm -hmm. is. Um, so you have time. So it's really important, especially for parents to, to, and kids to say, you know, don't panic. Okay, so, we did, so Tanner 2 is starting, and now we're going to uh, go back at our diagram here, and we're going to give a steady release of a gonadotropin-releasing hormone agonist, so something that biochemically is exactly the same as what the brain is producing and releasing in that pulsatile fashion, the off and on. So instead of off and on, you now have a steady release of that gonadotropin-releasing hormone, and the pituitary says, oh my gosh, there's so much of that stuff, I am turning off. So there's no luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone, and so then the, the testicles and the ovaries basically don't see the luteinizing hormone or follicle-stimulating yeah, follicle hormone, mm -hmm. and so basically puberty goes on pause. And so we say it's kind of like a pause button. It depends what kind of puberty blocker you use in terms of how often it is used. So you, there's Lupron, which is we, use, we know for um, cis women with uterine cancer, which can be given once a month or every three months. There's also Eligard, or they're both the same thing, luprolide acetate, and that's gonadotropin-releasing hormone, and it's in different formulations. I use a four-month formulation just because kids don't like shots. Who likes shots? And it's so every four months is, is what I how frequently I give this. There's also an implant. That's a small fortune that um, can be used, and that's good for two to three years. So that was that question. We have another question. Did I answer all parts of the question? The, does insurance cover this? Great question. So it depends on the insurance. So where I practice, um, my state, uh, so Medicaid does cover it because there was the mandate, the section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act. So that is covered. And any insurance in California that's from California has to cover it. Many of the insurance companies don't know that they have to cover it. So typically, I'm doing a lot of work with the insurance companies to inform them that they have to. So I often have to appeal denials. Um, some insurance companies do not cover it. And then um, we, I work with the families to use the least expensive form. Um, and when you use the puberty blocker, um, let's say it's time to start a cross hormone. So we used to think, based on the Dutch work, that you had to wait till the age of 16. Why 16? 
because in Holland, 16 is the age of consent. You're an adult when you're 16. So they made a choice to use an arbitrary age, and they used the age of, of adulthood. In our country, and, and in Holland, puberty starts much later. And uh, I think they're much less kind of focused on uh, puberty kind of culturally. In the U.S., waiting till the age of 16 to start puberty is too late. So we're um, starting cross hormones in a more age-appropriate time. So depending on the peers, like so if all your friends have gone through puberty, it's probably time for you too. Mm -hmm. um, and then just the individual situation with the family. And you, yeah? So if you use Lupralide, you know, <laughs> How long are you using Lupron for, yep. and what sort of, I mean, it's got some unpleasant side effects, Well, right? actually, if you have not gone through puberty, there really aren't any unpleasant side effects. The unpleasant side effects we know of for, um, for mature women having mm -hmm. um, cancer, uterine cancer, is the hot flashes. Right. But if you haven't gone through puberty, you you're not going to get that hot flash. So, <laughs> so actually, we're not, we're not seeing a lot of unpleasant side effects. But your question as to how long do we keep them on, is a, it's, it's uh, different depending on your practice. So some people, and, and what they do in Holland, is continue that puberty blocker until you remove your gonads. Because in Europe, most people do remove their gonads. In our country, although that's changing in Europe, because now there's more interest in, in fertility. In our country, because uh, also when we started doing this, um, removal of gonads was not covered by insurance. Um, we basically had to figure out what to do. So typically, um, we'll sort of taper off the blocker and then just use testosterone if you're a trans man or use spironolactone and estrogen if you're a trans woman. But it, it really varies depending on the situation, how long you stay on the blocker. Good question. And this is done through a specialist, someone like yourself that is, tr or not just your pediatrician. Right, um, so I'm teaching pediatricians how to do this because there really, there aren't enough specialists. And I would say that most endocrinologists are not familiar with this work. And what we're really, we're really trying to increase awareness and the, it'll be interesting to see what the endocrine society does. They're writing new recommendations, but um, I teach a lot of so a pediatrician could. I'm a family practice person, um, so I, th I think it's within the purview. It is more a little more complex than mm -hmm. than sort of a transgender care for adults, but I think it's I think it's learnable. And in regions where there's very few resources or knowledge, I think it makes sense. So there are centers now throughout the country. Um, so there's UCSF, um, LA has a um, a trans center, Chicago, Boston. I think Texas, I mean, I think that more and more um, centers are, are coming up. Okay, so if, tell me if there are more questions, but I'm going to back up because I had sort of a um, sort of slides to tie it all together. Okay. Um, and then if we have time, I can go through some of the resources. And what, it, how many more minutes do we have? Um, seven. Five. Five. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, um, I don't know if folks are catching up in the for all of you with slides on your computers. Um, these are some terminology concepts that I just wanted to review, um, but please do send your questions if you have them. So basically, um, transgender or trans is an umbrella term. So people whose gender or gender identity or gender expression is different from their sex assigned at birth. Assigned sex is your biological sex, quote unquote, or your chromosomes, your anatomy, based on external genitalia. Gender identity is that deeply felt sense of being male or female or something in between, and really independent of assigned sex, and it can be fluid. Gender expression is kind of how I wear or how I do my, how I wear my gender in the world. And th this can be a little complex. So we're looking at your gender biology, your internal sense of gender, and your outward expression. And so what's on your birth certificate really may or may, or may not reflect what your gender is, even though it says, you know, your gender box. 
sexual orientation we reviewed quite a bit is really different from gender identity and gender expression. And we had that sort of cutesy phrase, sexual orientation is who I go to bed with and gender identity is who I go to sleep as. And these are the basic concepts. Genitals do not determine gender. Gender is on a spectrum rather than binary. Um, Transgender identity is not a pathology or a mental illness, and I, I'm, I'm not sure I reviewed this enough in the conversation. So gender identity disorder was in the DSM. It still is in the DSM, renamed as gender dysphoria. Um, but for many of us doing this work, we really think it doesn't belong in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual DSM, just as being gay or lesbian was in the DSM um, up until 1970. Um, it's just really an endocrine disorder and belongs in our, you know, our whatever we call it, the ICD, you know. Oh, and that said, the ICD-10 has been very problematic because the F64.1, which is what we were using for many, for when it started, and we thought that was gender dysphoria, now is popping up as trans fetishism or something. And it's like, oh my gosh. So... There's a lot of work to be done, and it's really frustrating um, to find, you know, what is, the, what is an ICD-10 diagnosis that's respectful. Um, just going back to our basic concepts, access to hormones improves health, and exploring our gender journey is really essential to patient-centered care. And I think that's really what we're moving towards now is patient-centered care. It's not about us. It's about our patients. Mm -hmm. What can we do to help their... Care. So um, since we are not getting questions, yell to me if one comes through. Um, these are some books um, and blogs that I think are really um, helpful. Trans Bodies, Trans Selves came out a few years ago, and it's modeled after Our Bodies, Ourselves, and is a great resource, a beautiful book written by the trans community. The Gender Creative Child uh, by Diane Ehrensaft and Gender Born, Gender Made are very um Nice books if you're interested in youth. Transgender 101 is a great um, resource for kind of language and terminology to share with parents in particular. She's Not There, A Life in Two Genders is a book written by Jennifer Boylan, who often writes for the New York Times. It's her biography or autobiography about her life and really well written. And if you, I, I highly recommend that book to just sort of get deeper in the experience of being a trans woman in the world. Um, and then I already mentioned the non-binary transition, Nutrois.me. And then Second Son by a uh, dear friend, Ryan Salins, um, is, shares his journey as a transgender man. The transgender child and the transgender teen, I think, are really useful um, if you're working or interested in working with kids or if you have friends or family. I think I'm finding that more and more people have someone who's trans um, in their personal life. So there's more... Uh, you know, movies and TVs and documentary. I think some of you have probably seen Transparent. Um, I Am Jazz is um, a TV program f done by Jazz, who's a trans youth, a trans girl. I think she's about 16 now. No Dumb Questions is a sweet, sweet video. Um, From Three to Infinity, I shared with you already. Straight Laced, How Gender's Got Us All Tied Up, is really useful in terms of language. Is it time to stop? No, we have a phone call oh. from Tuscaloosa. So Excellent. Good. Caller, you are on. Can we have your question? Yes, I had a question just for clarification purposes. Great. As far as the word queer, yeah, I was always under the impression that that was more taboo. So I was just making sure that I had a clear understanding. So right. as long right. as the person themselves mm -hmm. identify themselves as a queer, it's okay. Okay, to use that word. That if the Great person question. use it, then mm -hmm. that's, thank you for the question. So mm -hmm. yes, queer was a excuse me very derogatory yeah. term for you know in my life as well, but um, in certain communities, queer has become um, a very powerful word and a a, pro, a word associated with pride. That said, it really depends on your community. So. Uh, if the person uses it, the word themselves, for themselves, then I think you have permission to use it. And it, I would say um, you could ask and say, I just want to check in with you and make sure it's okay that, that I use 
that the word queer um, is respectful. So great question. And that's really true with all language. And um, I'm so impressed with how different communities, both within the US and throughout the world, use different language. And so we have to sort of be attuned to mm -hmm. the language. Thanks so much for your question. I have one last yeah. question. Is UCSF embracing you know, teaching transgenderism to their medical students and docs who yes. are going to be going yes. out and of the there is, um, um, Yes, and um, I will try to get you the document. There is an American um, Medical College's document, or document um, on LGBTQ health. So they are teaching it at UCSF, and we're hoping, and I think there are other medical schools as we well. We have another call. Oh, good. Uh, so um, call from Tuscaloosa. Go ahead. The other part of my question, just so I'll have <laughs> Great. a better understanding, intersect. Is that more so just what they feel from within is their sexual status? Oh, intersex? Yes. Oh, great question. So intersex is actually um, a designation um, that is it's a medical term uh, for someone who may have ambiguous genitalia or um, basically you can't determine what that person's gender is at birth. They're a, about, gosh, um, maybe 50 different intersex conditions and medical conditions. So it actually doesn't refer to sexuality. It's more what the um, what is the chromosomal sexual gender of this person, but not, a, not referring to sexuality. And so an intersex, and actually I'm sorry I didn't put this slide in. I do have it. An intersex person may or may not identify as transgender. Um, so many intersex, so and many people don't know that they're intersex. In fact, I have a new patient who's who um, just found out she's in her fifties. Um, so and some intersex conditions are life threatening, and and people can young babies can die if they're not treated appropriately. And other times it may be just like someone with a very small penis or a child with a very small penis, and then chromosomal studies are done, and in fact they're found that. Um, to have an intersex condition. So thank you for that question. Are the, is she there she's still? Gone. She's gone. She hung up. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think we're at our time. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much, everybody. We just yeah. want to thank you oh, thank so much, you. Dr. Jennifer Hastings. Um, extraordinary information. And I think the take home message is um, to us to be open and to be welcoming and to be safe and, and that's Thank what you. I've heard a lot about. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we're still on, but I'm going to go to my um, last slide, which has my email contact. So people feel free to, not that I, yeah, I will do mm -hmm. my best to respond quickly to your questions if you have them. Okay. Thank you. Just remember this will be on demand um, in about a couple of days. Thank oh. you all.